Good afternoon, everyone. So today we're going to talk about cost optimization in cloud. But first, I have a really important question. Uh, who has seen the movie The Kung Fu Panda? Awesome. Way more than I expected. So for those of you who haven't, uh, i got to tell you the story of it because it's going to matter for this later. Uh, in this movie, The Kung Fu Panda, it's a great movie. You've got Jack Black playing this very large, very inept, very bumbling panda bear. And through a weird sequence of events in the movie, this panda bear, who couldn't fight his way out of the noodle shop that he works in, is responsible for protecting the village from this evil, coursing uh, tiger warrior who's coming to attack. Uh, and the only way he knows how to do this is there's this uh, ancient kung fu master who gives him this scroll. And the scroll is supposed to contain the secret, the secret ingredient to kung fu mastery. So right before he goes to actually fight this evil tiger warrior, he cracks open the scroll, and he looks down at it, and it's blank. There's, there's nothing on it. He just sees his reflection uh, shining back in his face. And his heart kind of sinks. And that's the moment that we find a lot of companies experience when they go to get into the spend optimization world. It's just they're looking for the secret ingredient. They're trying to find what is the one thing that I can learn from some master so I can go be the hero in my company and slay this you know, rising tide of cloud spend. So what we're going to talk about today is how you get to that secret ingredient of cost optimization. So a more serious question so we can understand where you guys are in the room. A show of hands, how many of you are buying reserved instances? Great. This has changed a lot the last couple of years of reInvent. Uh, keeping your hands up for those who are doing it, how many are buying hundreds of reserve instances? Nice. Thousands? A couple. Awesome. Uh, how many of you are right sizing? Fewer. Okay. And how many of you have metrics that you track against those things? Excellent. More than expected. So two of us are going to be speaking up here today. Uh, my name is J.R. Stormont. I'm co-founder of Cloudability and general manager for our EMEA region. Uh, Cloudability is a SaaS platform that delivers a data analytics engine focused on helping the, uh, improve the economics of cloud. So we work with a lot of uh, scaled tech companies like Atlassian. We work with a lot of scaled enterprises like General Electric. Uh, we manage about $5 billion of cloud spend for these companies and provide them tools to do spend optimization and visibility and get better at improving the economics. I'm uh, going to be joined by Mike Fuller, who's principal, principal systems engineer at Atlassian, which is a very fancy term to say that he's a smart guy who manages all their cloud spend uh, in their cloud center of excellence. Um, how many of you use, use uh, Atlassian products? Most of you. Great. Yeah, we're also a customer. Um, so Mike and I have both been on the cloud journey for about seven years, been working together for probably three, three and a half. Um, he's come up from Sydney, which you'll hear from his accent in a minute. I came in from London, which you're probably not hearing from my accent. Uh, so we didn't get a lot of chances to actually rehearse this together until yesterday, so bear with us as we work through it. Hopefully we'll give you some nuggets. So I want to start with a story of when companies really start to optimize in cloud and what that journey looks like. And if you're in cloud, you've probably seen this growth curve happen as you go bigger and bigger. So the journey in cloud typically starts kind of like your first night in Vegas. You have a nice drink or two. You spin up some dev and test instances. It feels good. It's very easy. You're getting what you need. And so you have a couple more. You spin up some more instances, have a couple more drinks, and then suddenly you have what we call an involuntary load test, where you're spending more than you meant to. Bill goes up, you get yourself together, drink some water, you get it under control, and then you typically move into maybe a more formal POC, right, where you've gone through the security processes to understand uh, what's happening. You've got the sign-offs, you've got requirements, and these typically go well in AWS. So shortly after that, then companies will tend to bring in uh, their first applications into production, app one, app two, app three, uh, and at this stage, people aren't really typically talking about spend, spend optimization costs, because usually the bill's not big enough to really matter, right? Uh, if you're a SaaS company uh, and your cloud is OpEx and cost of goods sold, it's not really yet affecting margins. If you're a bigger enterprise, it's probably paling in comparison to the overall IT budget. So it just kind of continues up and up and up. Uh, until you finally cross that threshold where it starts affecting margins, or uh, the OpEx gets too big as a variable expense for finance to be comfortable. And you hit this point where someone on the executive team, or maybe the CFO or a director, starts really caring about the bill. And this is the point at which companies start to have that moment where they're like, what do we do? I, I, I need the secret ingredient. I need to lean in. I need to learn the one thing I can do to get this under control and start to optimize it over time. So we're going to talk about where people usually start with that. And Mike's going to share the story of how Atlassian ended up at that spot. 
Uh, after he does that, I'm going to circle back and give you uh, sort of the basic fundamentals uh, that we see companies go through, for those of you who aren't as long on the journey, of how to start optimizing your rates and your usage in those areas. And then we're going to tie it all together with Mike telling uh, a detailed story about how Atlassian rolls this out at their teams, all metrics driven at scale, and operationalizes it at a massive cloud spend level. Over to you, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, so my name is Mike Fuller. I've worked for Atlassian for over five and a half years, and I've been lucky enough to be part of Atlassian's cloud journey into AWS. I started out years ago with a few teams just opening up a few accounts, doing some EC2 and some S3, but it quickly became an important offering for Atlassian as we started to move more and more of our production workloads into the cloud. As this growth progressed, it quickly became important for, uh, apparent for Atlassian that we needed to have a team to get it all under control. And that was when my team at Atlassian was formed, and we call ourselves the cloud engineering team. Amazon called teams like ours the cloud center of excellence, but we're basically a bunch of engineers that are highly trained in the cloud platform. So we work alongside our engineering teams with the way they architect and deploy. We work alongside our security teams with the way things are configured inside the cloud to keep us secure. And for important for this talk, we work alongside our finance and procurement department around cost allocation and cost optimization. Not, not long after we formed our team, we decided to do our first cost optimization, and we reached out, like m most teams, to the EC2 reserved instance. And we spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars on EC2 and we, our eyes, and we thought that this would just have a massive drop in our cloud spend bill. We would be able to show that drop uh, to the business and say, hey, look, we're now cost optimized. It was our one major secret ingredient we'd mix in with our accounts. The next month, bill come in, but it just continued to increase. Um, and all we had was the PDF invoice that was just, there's no line in there that's telling us how much we're saving, just how much we're paying. And it left us with a whole heap of questions. Were we actually saving any money? Did we use our RIs correctly? Should we just be buying more reserved instances? Or is there some other cost optimization we should have been doing? There was one thing we were definitely certain of, and that was that we needed to get better at cost optimization. So if you're in the room at this point today, then don't fear because we didn't get it right the first time either, and you can turn it around and get well cost optimized. So we thought the EC2 reserved instance was just the secret ingredient. We'd mix it in, we'd be cost optimized, but it didn't really turn out that way. And the reality is there's no single secret ingredient. It's around you and your team the metrics you're using to drive your cost optimization, and then the processes that you're deploying around your organization. So after JR goes over all of the cost optimizations available to you, not just the EC2 reserved instance, and how these things have changed over the last 18 months on Amazon's ever-changing platform, I'll get to come back and talk about how we drive results in cost optimization today by utilizing metrics in reserved instances, right sizing, and elasticity. And I'll be able to sort of show you what success looks like at today at Atlassian, using metrics to drive our cost optimization, having 100% cost allocation throughout the organization, and then trying to drive a lean culture within Atlassian. Yeah. So unfortunately, no secret ingredient, but we do find that there is a really basic formula that's important to keep in mind as you're starting to tackle uh, spend optimization. Uh, it may seem almost too simple, of course, this is what it is, but no matter how big your bill is and how many hundreds of gigabytes of CSV data you're getting in your detailed billing reports or how many instances you're running, most of the spending comes down to this equation, right? So the bill is composed of a usage, how many instances, how many gigabytes, how many whatever you're using, Lambda functions, times the rate you're paying for those uh, pieces. And as we work through this process, we're going to keep those two in mind because they essentially give us two levers or levers for the Brits in the room uh, that let you pull two uh, basically avoid costs, right, by using less, or reduce rates by paying less. And the interplay between these two is really important, and the timing at which you do them is also a source for constant debate, at the risk of asking you a lot of questions. Uh, how many of you think that you should avoid costs first, use less? Nobody. Okay, how many of you think you should reduce rates first? Nobody's really sure any of those. Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to this at the end. He's going to tell you what his take there is. 
Um, so we'll start with the first one, avoiding costs. So this is about how do we use less and turn things off that we're not using. So another basic principle is starting with first things first, the big spenders. Uh, there's a lot of shiny optimizations you can do. There's a tons of ways that you can turn things off. But start looking at the big chunks of the pie. So this is an aggregated view of about $5 billion of cloud spend across different services uh, and what the top ones are. And not really surprising, EC2 is the big chunk, right? So a lot of people want to start there. Uh, what is interesting, I thought, is you know, EBS, huge area, uh, snapshot waste, unused volumes, all of those are a typical thing to look at. RDS, S3, and then it gets into long tail over time. So start with these services is the first step. And then you look at the low-hanging fruit, right? So initially, turning off things that just aren't being used. It's, it's always amazing to me when we pull up somebody's infrastructure and look at right-sizing tools for them, how much uh, there are just idle resources that are doing nothing. So start with those. Uh, then we want to get into resizing things that are too big. It's often very exciting to pull up the AWS console and look at the new, you know, uh, what is the biggest one now? 16 extra large, I think you can get, instance, and say, I need that. I need that instance, right? I need the C5. Uh, and then not really, you guys lose sound here? There we go. And then not really actually go back and fix that later. So uh, definitely want to look to see where you've got things that are too big that we can get to smaller size. And then start to automate, ideally, shutdowns of these things over time or resizing them so we're not doing it in a retroactive fashion. We're doing it as we see it. So digging into each of those three. First, terminating unused instances. Again, the areas you're going to want to focus on, idle EC2, uh, unused EBS volumes, uh, snapshots are also a big thing in EBS where we see a lot of people automating the creation of those and then them hanging out for a long time. Uh, S3, a uh, lot of waste potential in there. Uh, you want to look to find things that potentially are not being accessed, that could be moved to infrequent access or glacier. Uh, and then, of course, RDS as well. Uh, key thing here is, ideally, if you're looking at tooling for do this, if example of the cloudability report here, you really want to look at the combination of both high cost and low uses, usage. So we'll actually give you a priority score so you can help uh, categorize and figure out what to tackle first. So from the right-sizing perspective, a couple things to keep in mind uh, as fundamentals. Um, first of all, you may not be in the right family to start. Just because you started at M4 doesn't mean you might not want to go to T2 or to C4 or to C5. So definitely when you're looking at moving around, consider uh, not just sizing up and down, going from a 4x to a 2x to a 1x, but maybe even potentially looking uh, based on the characteristics of the usage to go over to another area. Uh, we'll give you a bunch of really good options around to do this that sort of risk, show you risk versus reward, because that's another thing you want to factor in, right? It may be that there's a very high saving as an instance type change that you can make, but you're going to be pushing the boundaries uh, of the resource limits for that and may get things like CPU clipping at the end. Uh, also critical, uh, a lot of people, when they start this process, they just look at average CPU. Uh, they just sort of get that out of a tooling or they calculate that. You really, of course, need to look at the max CPUs, so making sure that you're finding when those things are peaking up and down and hitting the bottoms. The next step is to move into that automatic scheduling. Uh, ideally, you want to be doing cloud spend management in a proactive fashion, right? So the typical areas would be scaling up and down auto-scaling groups, uh, scheduling instances to come up and down nights and weekends, uh, snapshots, as I mentioned, are another big area. Ideally, you want to be identifying, uh, when you've got too many of those, uh, snapshotting and removing those volumes over time. To dwell a little bit on the nights and weekends aspect, if you look at the, uh, the size of any given week, right? So you've got 168 hours in a week. Uh, 108 of those hours are nights and weekends, right? So that's 60 plus percent of your week are times when you could be shutting down. So while, yes, uh, right-sizing down can save you a lot of money, and RIs, as we'll get to, will save you a lot of money, if you can actually be shutting things off during these periods, even if it's just for that one period between Sunday morning and uh, Saturday morning and Sunday morning where all the time zones are offline, there's a lot of savings to tackle there. So we've talked a little bit about the basics about how you can re uh, avoid costs. Let's talk about the other side, which is you've turned all the things off. How do we make sure we're paying the least amount possible for the things we are using? So on the reducing rate side, you've got a number of different levers to pull. Uh, typically, you're going to start with on-demand, of course. And then you're going to start to look at reserved instances. Spot is another area. And of course, as you get bigger and spend more, there's volume discounts as part of that process. So you've got the most flexibility. We'll probably talk the most about reserved instances today. And we'll touch on spot as well. Critical thing uh, I always go back to with reserved instances, which is reserved instances are not tied to instances. It's unfortunately not a, a very well-named thing. Uh, RIs are coupons. They're coupons that give you a discount. They're billing construct only. And up until recently, those were hourly coupons, where you got 744 of them in a, in a month that could be applied against an instance that matches the criteria 
of the coupon that you have. Not a specific instance, but one that matches that criteria. So what's happened with per second billing that Amazon rolled out recently is that now you've got 2.6 million coupons that can be applied. So this gives you some really great advantages, which is if things are coming up and down and moving around a lot, you can have better applications, better granularity of where they're going, but the management and visibility into where those are going and why becomes much more complex. So on the reserved instance front, um, I did a talk last year that was a deep dive in RIs. Um, a lot of stuff has stayed the same in the last year. These are kind of the key things. You know, you still have one or three year uh, versions of those. You have three year convertibles that are a great option. We'll dig into those in a minute here. And all the RI types now have three payment options, no upfront, partial, and all upfront. Um, I think at one point the three year, convert, three year standards didn't have no upfronts, but that's all covered now. Uh, convertible RIs, anybody buying those currently? Cool, just a few. So really great RI in the fact that you can buy it for one thing and later exchange it for any other size, region, AZ, whatever you want. It's sort of like a small commitment into uh, EC2 for a certain amount of time. Uh, last year there was a three-year option. There's a new option I'll talk about in a minute that was just introduced. But they give you a lot of flexibility as your infrastructure changes. Uh, the fourth thing is regional benefit, a critical piece that uh, stayed the same last year. You no longer need to peg reserve instances into AZs. They now cover within a whole region. So if you've got things running in US East 1, it'll cover A, B, C, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of choices there. Uh, if you're looking at them, we'll give you some great tools to actually tell you what all the savings rates are broken into that, as well as what the break-even points for those are. Break-even points are really important, still something to lean into. A one-year commitment to EC to an RI doesn't necessarily mean you have to be running it for a year. You may actually only need to run it for three or four or five months before you're starting to make the money back. So. What has changed, I went one slide too far. There we go. Uh, so what's new with reserve in 2017? A couple things, the biggest change uh, that I think affected uh, most people was the instant size flexibility. So if you look at this graph here, looking at a bunch of different instances running, it used to be you needed to buy a reserved instance for an 8XL or for a 4XL or for a 2XL. With the introduction of instant size flexibility, now you basically can think in terms of units. A 4XL can be applied to a 2XL. A medium, can be, a number of those can be stacked together to go to a large or an extra large, et cetera. So this lets you, when you're doing regional RIs, so non-AZ and only for Linux currently, it lets you have a lot of flexibility in buying within a size and also lets you potentially buy the RIs before you right size them up and down. A big change that happened uh, actually after the first version of this deck, we had to go back and add it, uh, was one year convertible RIs. Uh, these are a fantastic option that says you get all that flexibility of the convertibles we talked about where you can switch sizes and regions and OSs, uh, but it's now only a one year commitment. Uh, they also just added uh, a feature of convertible RIs called uh, splitting and merging. So previously, uh, if you had a large subscription or a large size of those, you couldn't break them into smaller units. Uh, and our former recommendation would be to buy a lot of small convertibles so you could stack them up. Uh, now they'll let you split those uh, convertible reservations into smaller pieces. Uh, and critically, you can also now take two reservation subscriptions from different dates and combine them together into a single one. Um, there's some nuance there. If you have one year and three year commitments and you merge those, you end up with all three year commitments, uh, but definitely a lot more flexibility in how you can manage those. The last big change, which just happened, I think, October 2nd, uh, was Amazon went from hourly to per second billing. Uh, this is a real boon for highly elastic companies. Uh, I think Mike and I were talking about Atlassian. This saved them tens of thousands of dollars overnight because they're bringing things up and down all the time and they're no longer paying for things that are running you know, maybe just for a few seconds. Uh, it has made tracking of RIs much more complex uh, and the application of those as well. So this always leaves the question, I've got all these RI choices, what do I choose? Right, where do I start? And unfortunately, there's not really a right answer to which one to choose, it really depends. And I probably, you probably want to end up with a portfolio that's a combination of these. So looking at the one-year convertible, uh, those are the ones that have the least commitment. You're saying, if I have a low commitment to EC2, I want to do a one-year level. You know, I may be moving into RDS, I may have trying to do some serverless, I'm not totally stuck in there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a one year. Uh, those give you high flexibility, you can change everything, but the savings rate is lowest, 28, 30, 32%. The one year standard, which is the RI that uh, last year I would say probably 80% of people were buying, uh, you know, is we call a low commitment to EC2 still, it's not a year commitment necessarily, because again, the break even point for this may be five months out or six months out, uh, and low flexibility except for Linux. So in Linux, we have the ability uh, with these to change uh, the size of these and have them apply through instant size flexibility. 
The three-year convertibles, uh, which is the ones that I'm guessing the folks who raised their hand are using currently, unless they've just started buying one years, uh, are fantastic in the sense you change everything, but it's a long term, right? it's a long chunk. Now, I, I like to think of these uh, as sort of, uh, you don't necessarily have to make a commitment to you know, an instant size or region, you're just saying, I'm gonna be an EC2 for a while. So we're gonna go with those. Uh, and then three-year standards uh, have been around for a long time, uh, highest savings rate, but it's, you, you got, really gotta know you're gonna be running that thing for a while. And again, it may not be three years, the break-even point may be nine months or a year, uh, but some really good savings opportunities with those. Anybody doing one-year convertibles yet? One person, awesome. Yeah, one-year convertibles I think are really gonna be a game changer. Um, in terms of giving you both the ability to flex and also uh, get some of that commitment or that discount down. So let's talk a little bit about the strategy for how you need to think about stacking together uh, instance hours, or now instance seconds, into buying reserved instances. So most people, when they start with RIs, think, I've got an instance running for a long time, I should reserve it. Where in reality, what you wanna do is start to think about an hourly, or now second level, frequency distribution that says, in each of these rows, and A here is all one instance running a series of seconds, and B is one instance running a series of seconds, and C, there's a different ones happening. How many of that type of instance am I running in this set of seconds at what percentage threshold, and then how many of those do I wanna cover? So in the world where we are saying, okay, one, two, three, four, first four rows are 100%, and I wanna cover 100% of my, uh, uh, I want to cover the instance hours that have 100% running, we would basically buy four RIs in there. Uh, if I want to go to 90% coverage rate, I'd go up to five, six to uh, 80, et cetera. I think you guys run about 90, is that your level that you typically target? For utilization, yeah. For utilization. So they, in this case, would buy basically five RIs. And it's really a question of how comfortable and confident you are with your own elasticity. If you're running things, if you're lift and shift, and everything's on all the time, you could push this up into you know, 60%. You might buy up to the you know, six, seven RI level. Uh, if you're more elastic, as Atlassian is, and we used to have a debate where I said that their RI coverage was crap, and he said, well, that's because we're moving things up and down at time, so we can't really get it that high, because you don't want to be covering hours where things are gonna be turning off. So your rate, your coverage rate may be much lower in that case. So the next thing with the RI strategy to consider is starting to look to how you can combine that water line, figuring out that threshold. You wanna be at 90%, you wanna be at 80, whatever it is. And then thinking in terms of instant size flexibility and then also leveraging convertibles. So what this lets you do as you're starting to think about buying RIs is not to think of necessarily about, again, the size, the 4XL, the 8XL, but what number of units do I wanna buy, normalized units? Because again, we're collapsing down to how many mediums, what's the smallest amount that I need that we can stack into uh, the best coverage rate. Um, then you're gonna look at those units, and the other thing to consider is also considering you know, things you already own, right? You need to make sure that you're covering, uh, we own this portfolio of our eyes, and we're taking those units and combining those in. Uh, the great thing about using the waterline along with instant size flexibility and convertibles is you can now start to buy a lot of our eyes before you necessarily finish your right sizing process. Uh, next thing to consider if you're not, how many are running spot instances? Okay, good chunk. Uh, so for those of you who aren't doing spot, um, really great way to save money. You can get down to probably 80% off uh, in some cases, but it does require you to run, uh, to have workloads that can be interrupted, uh, that stop and start, batch jobs, things like that, or to uh, engineer around that. So uh, one of the things we definitely recommend before running necessarily spot is to consider the unused reserve instances you might have that you're paying for, uh, that you uh, could be running against, uh, and possibly end up in a place where you're de-risking it by having a combination of some spot some on-demand, some RIs, et cetera. Uh, we've got some great tooling around this uh, that lets you basically define a workload. You can say, I need you know, this much CPU, this much memory, et cetera. And then we'll look at the billions of hours of spot that we observe from our customers. We'll look at your unused RIs. We'll look at on-demand and basically rec make a recommendation of here's where we think you should run this workload. Uh, great thing about spot being so cheap, we often see customers over-provisioning it a bit. Uh, it's a nice, nice bit of benefit there that you can tackle. So those are some of the basics around the avoiding costs and reducing rates. Let's talk about how to organize uh, this cost optimization work within your uh, company. So if we go back to those two levers, right? So we've got the lever of using less and then reducing what we're paying for those things. The best practice we've seen develop around this is one where you're decentralizing using less, meaning you're pushing the shared accountability out to the application owner, the workload owner, whoever's running that resource, for them to decide what they should turn off. And then you're centralizing the paying less the reserved instances, for example, with a central you know, cloud center of excellence team 
who can make those uh, calculations, the hourly frequency distributions, to get you the right number of RIs. The reason for this is if we go back to this graph that we looked at earlier, in your enterprise, and certainly I'm guessing in a company like Atlassian that's very elastic and lots of workloads, these instances that are running in any particular second may not all be coming from the same workload. You may have 100 workloads or 1,000 workloads or even five, and you know, instance A is from one, B is from another, C is from another. So if you push out the RI management to the people who are just managing their individual workload, they may start buying RIs for just their workload, where in reality, those RIs can be shared across all the workloads. You can use an economy of scale of having different things coming up and down in different projects that are going to overlap and fill out this frequency distribution. So we see people centralizing that around this new role that's developed. Uh, we used to call it the, the RI czar. I think the term I'm seeing now more and more on LinkedIn is the cloud economist. Uh, and this is somebody who is basically, their whole job is optimizing the efficiency, economics, spending in cloud. It may be just RIs. It may be uh, pushing out the best practices for right sizing. It may be defining the patterns for the dashboards and visibility that people are looking at. Uh, and it's a pretty compelling case, though, to get one of these or to, to hire one or to assign someone into this. So if you think about saving 30% of your bill, if you're spending a million dollars a year, that very quickly pays for somebody. If you're spending tens of millions of dollars a year, we've seen companies have literally a team of these people, three, four, five, who are focused on optimizing these things. Notably, uh, it's sort of a split role, right? It's not usually an engineer who's doing this. It's not really a finance person. It's somebody who's probably got is an analyst of some sort. They probably are a technologist, but they understand both the business implications as well as the technology underneath. Uh, sometimes they can sit, seen them sit in the CTO's team, we've seen them sit in finance teams, but it's somebody who can translate between the two sides. A uh, really critical thing, if you're working with any cloud providers who are giving you any custom pricing, if you're not paying a list price with a, a cloud provider uh, behind the scenes, then you want to make sure that this person and the tools they're using are factoring in that custom pricing into the RI planning decision making. Because the break-even points, the savings thresholds, all of that are not going to work if you're not factoring that in. And when we talk about that, we call it true cost, right? So uh, out of uh, any cloud provider, you're going to get a list price that comes out of the billing data that happens. Uh, but you want to take that list price that comes out of it, and you want to enrich it with certain things. You want to enrich it with the discounts. So you might want to knock some points off of that if that's happening. You want to add in credits that you're, or take credits off that you might be getting for any you know, special programs you're a part of. Uh, you also need, particularly from the RI conversation, you need to factor in the amortizations for the payments that you made before. So if you buy an RI in January and you're still running it in October and you're doing a cash basis of your accounting, none of that payment that you made in January is going to show up in your October bill. It's going to look like you're spending a lot less than you are. Whereas your finance team is likely going to be doing an accrual basis and amortizing that forward. So when you're looking at doing that true cost calculation around the visibility for how much you're spending or the RIs that you're buying, you need to be carrying forward all those amortizations as well. So make sure you're factoring that in as you're going through the process. And this is something that we can do for you as well. So thinking about RIs, uh, there are really two sides to the coin to this. Uh, you've got your infrastructure, which is highly elastic, right? Things are coming up and down, it's auto-scaling, changing, migration spikes, et cetera. Uh, you also have your RIs on the other side that need to be changing quickly with it as well. You need to be modifying them, exchanging them, keeping up to date. So we recommend going through a really iterative, lean process where you are constantly making purchases, buying new RIs, measuring the results of those, and then learning from those and making changes, making the exchanges, making the mods. So your first buys, and arguably almost all your buys, which hopefully you're doing monthly, weekly even, ideally, uh, if you're really at scale, uh, should be small and uncontroversial. They're things that you know uh, you're going to be confident running in. Uh, this becomes a little more flexible in a convertible RI world. Um, and another critical thing there also is to focus on the current time period. RIs are just in time purchasing. You don't need to buy for where you're going or where you've been. You want to look at what are we doing now, and is that a representative state of the future? So why should you decentralize the usage reduction on the other side of that? So every day in cloud, you now have this world where lots of people are making decisions about spending. You've got ops engineers and DevOps people clicking buttons in the console or using their build scripts and things happening. So what you want to do now is basically give them a better view of the world. So in the old days, if you think about when somebody was driving a car and they wanted to see how efficient they were, uh, and you had a dashboard like this, you'd have to like fill up with fuel, and you'd have to record your mileage, and then you know, at the end of the tank, you'd have to divide your, how many miles you drove by you know, how many gallons you put in the tank to figure out the miles per gallon. And there wasn't really good feedback loop. So people didn't really think too much about the efficiency, they just drove. 
for all those people who are making decisions, you want to give them a better feedback loop now. You want to give them a view like this, a dashboard that says, okay, when I put my foot down heavily on the pedal, the energy flows out of the battery heavily into the wheels, and if I let up, it goes back. And that's the type of feedback loop you want to create for these people so that every day as they're making changes to their infrastructure, they can see the impact of those changes on the cost, et cetera. Uh, and what that ultimately results in, which Mike's going to get into details here, is pushing accountability out to the edges, giving each of those teams the insights, the dashboards, the recommendations they need to just look and optimize at their portion of the spend data and doing that on a metrics-driven basis. All right, over to you, Mike. So when I left before, I had made an RI purchase and we didn't know what was going on. Um, and the reason for that was pretty simple. If we look at the cost optimization loop, we had executed a buy, but we hadn't done any of the other stages. In my team at Alassian today, we spend the majority of our time in this phase. We measure. So much so that we won't go around the cost optimization loop until we have particular measurements in place. These measurements should be able to show us where we can potentially save. Where are we unoptimized? I should be able to see that in a measurement. And then when I go around the loop, this should change that we are now more optimized. And then of the actual optimizations themselves, we want to make sure that they're actually performing as we expected. So if I have RIs, are they being utilized? Are they actually saving me money? So I talked about the idea that we have measurements in elasticity, right sizing, and reserved instances. But all of these metrics, they have to have a target. Because without a target on the measurement, it's just data. I don't know if I'm on track or need to be doing some work. Now, how many of you in the room can allocate every dollar in your bill to some business unit around your organization? You? The way we do it at Elastian is through tagging. We have a good tagging policy, and it's distributed around the whole organization. We have buy-in from our teams who build tagging into their CI, CD deployments. Resources get tagged as soon as they're created. And then we build enforcement on this, which would shut down or remove resources that don't have the correct tagging according to our policy. And then nothing's perfect. There will be some costs that fall through the through this gaps that don't have the right tag or, or uh, untagged. So we have a process to actually allocate these individual um, costs out to a particular business unit that they can own. And this means that every dollar on our, on our invoice is owned by some business unit in the company that is responsible for that cost. Now, with the actual cost optimizations themselves, the order that we do these in is really important. Now, just like in mathematics, if I do things out of order, I'm going to get a vastly different result. So the order that we do things at Atlassian is around good service design first, being well architected, using the elasticity of the cloud, scaling things in and out or getting them turned off, like JR talked about, in, in the off hours, nights and weekends. And what that actually looks like is this. If this is our actual EC2 usage over a period of time, maybe a month, you can see in the blue we're, we're scaling things up and down throughout the period. And if we weren't using the elasticity of the cloud, this graph would just be a solid blue bar. And what we can do is we can figure out the highest peak throughout the period and calculate what that would have cost over the month period. And if, if we subtract away the blue area of the graph, what we're left with is, this, is that savings that we've made in the white area of the graph. And we remember we have the tagging on our resources so I can figure out which teams are getting more savings through elasticity or even in which individual services they're running are more elastic. And by showing that to the business, I can drive that lean culture because teams can see who's getting the most savings through elasticity because they're well architected. And then we move on to right sizing. And we do this before reserved instances at Atlassian. And the, and the reason is pretty simple. If I can half the size of an EC2 instance, I half my cost. I've not made any, con any commitment to Amazon. The next day I could change its size again. I'm not locked in for 12 to, 20 to 36 months. But if that change in size is working really well for us, we can then further put an RI on the smaller size instance and save even more. <laughs> but when we do change that instance size, we need to make sure that we don't clip. And what we mean here is the, the workload that's running on it, if I start reducing the size of the CPU I have available for the, the instance, then we don't want that workload to start hitting 100% CPU because that would then be re represented as a performance problem in our products and our customers wouldn't be happy with that. And at Atlassian, our customers come first. 
By utilizing the right sizing tool within Cloudability, we can actually visualize our previous history of usage on the box. And then in the red line, as we click through our recommendations, we can figure out how much of that headroom we, we are coming down as we're changing in the size. Now, it's important that we actually get offered a few offerings that we could change to here because some workloads might not play well with particular EC2 uh, offerings. But more importantly, we actually get different savings amount that we could make if we change to different sizes. And then our engineers are able to balance off the risk versus benefit. It might mean that they go for something in the middle range of the savings because the, the extra reduction in size doesn't save that much more. Now, right sizing is just literally a list of recommendations, one after the other, for every instance that should potentially be changed in size. But remember, we have tags on the resources, so we can figure out who owns the individual resources. And by putting a, a view on the actual um, the right sizing report, what we can do is we can make it so that when the engineers log in and see their report, they're only seeing the instances that are in their remit and they can make their changes to only their instances and they're not having to filter through the list to find what's there, what, the, what is important to them. Now, we could sum up the amount of potential savings we have for each of our teams because we can work out which ones are for which teams and we could then compare teams against each other with the potential savings. And that's true, but we also look at it in a different way because we compare that with the amount of actual spend they have on the platform. So what that gives us is an actual wastage percentage. And this is a little bit more of a fair way to compare two teams against each other when they're using vastly different amounts of the cloud. Now, it's very important to see both figures, but it means that we can now set targets on wastage percentages per teams. And we're almost at the point of purchasing our reserved instances. But before we do that, we want to make sure that the ones we have already purchased are actually working efficiently. And for us, like we mentioned earlier, we want to hit 90% or greater utilization of our RI subscriptions, which means we're actually getting a pretty good saving for our commitments. So what we do is we track the actual utilization, the number of hours or seconds that we're applying a discount in our account versus not for every one of our subscription IDs. And if any one of those falls below our 90 percentile, the 90 percent utilization, sorry, we then look straight away for ways we can modify or exchange those RIs to get a better coverage. Within Cloudability, we can actually set this target. So if you decide to go with a more aggressive 95 percent, you can move the slider over a little bit, and then all of the recommendations are based on that. And then the modification recommendations are simple enough. We find this subscription, we change it from X to Y, and we should be able to get that better utilization. And now finally, we're at that point where we purchase reserved instances. And at Atlassian, we actually perform our own analytics. We go through and we work out all of those time series graphs. Um, we do trending, blah, blah, blah. And effectively, we get to a point where we say we should buy this many units of something. And this doesn't mean that we don't use Cloudability. What we do is we actually compare our results versus theirs. And where we agree, we actually build confidence that that purchase is going to be very successful for us, especially when you're committing to millions of dollars of RI. We use net present value calculations to decide between doing no upfront or partial upfront commitments. And then as soon as we execute a purchase, we go straight to measuring. Because there's a short period of time where AWS are kind of willing to work with you if you've made a bad mistake. So we want to make sure that those utilization rates are exactly where we expected them to be and the savings are being made. And now we talk about this idea that people do RI purchases on some sort of cadence, quarterly, monthly, weekly. Um, but we actually want to use the targets to tell us when it's time. And we can do that by using the coverage we have. So to calculate coverage, the first thing we do is we ignore every hour that we couldn't cover with an RI. If we purchased an RI for anything in the gray area of the graph, it wouldn't be making our utilization and therefore saving us money, so we exclude all of that. We then take our existing RIs down here in the dark blue, and we divide that out over our coverable hours. And this gives us an actual coverage percentage, how much of our workload is being covered. And at Atlassian, we go for an 80% coverage. 
This gives us with 20% on demand, which gives us, uh, our teams are able to do architecture changes, um, do the right sizing stuff that is available to them, but it means that we're not getting to a point, to a point where we're locked in, we can't make changes to our infrastructure. Now remember that a T2 saves us a different amount than say an M4 or now a C5. So what we do is we actually take these hours and we times them by the savings rate of each of these individual types. And then we can add all of that up and get an overall coverage and the coverage is actually coverage of savings, potential savings. Now we've gone all in on convertibles. And the story was this, we had this workload of coverable hours but then we had to exclude some of it because we're about to change our architecture or we're excluding others because they were really old gen instances. And we had two choices. We could lock our teams into using the older instances or tell them, hey, you know, there's limits to the amount that you can change your architecture. But by using convertibles, we're not locking them in. If they go and change from a C3 through to the new C5s, we can just do an exchange of our RIs and move them onto those new instance types. Amazon just announced new instance types, they're immediately available to our teams. We're not telling them, whoa, 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 you've got to wait for your, your existing commitments to roll off before you can start using them. And then importantly, a lot of people don't realize that if Amazon announce a price drop, I'm not locked into the our old RI rate. I can perform a exchange on those RIs and immediately gain benefit of that price drop. So this is our order of operations get good service design, use the elasticity of the cloud, change the size of your instances to fit your actual workload needs, modify your existing RI pools so that you're using what you have already optimally, and then we add more RIs as we need to keep our coverage rate uh, at that 80%. So while there's no secret ingredient, there's definitely a recipe for success. It's around the metrics using the metrics to drive your cost optimization. Using tagging in your, in your organization is absolutely critical because you, you need to understand where these savings are coming from, where the potential savings is within your organization, and be able to al allocate out the responsibility of your cost to the right people. We centralize RI, buying into my team. All teams come through us if they're interested in RI, and mostly we just do it without them knowing. And then we decentralize right sizing. We get that report out to the individual engineers to get those things actioned. The reports are targeted at, at the right level. If it's an engineer, they're seeing their instances. If it's a higher level management, they're seeing the overall summary of the cost potential and cost allocations they're seeing. Now you could start today trying to build all these reports yourself and you have to factor in the true cost of all these things, amortization, your discount rates, Amazon change things from hourly billing to per second. You're gonna constantly be developing and updating your graphs, or you can get started with third parties. You're gonna get straight into cost optimization, start making the savings today. So factor that in when you're deciding on the, on the path forward. So we've got some time for Q&A, uh, and I wanted to, looks like we've got 17 minutes. I, I wanted to see a question for you to get started. Um, the topic came up a couple times of what to do first, right? And you mentioned that you should right size and then buy our eyes. When do you think that would be flipped? When would you go buy our eyes instead of right sizing first? Yeah, so I guess the conversation we've had before is around the idea that companies uh, get to a position where they want to make savings right now. And, and right sizing takes a little while. You've got to engage your engineers, get them to look at organizing maintenance windows or changing some deployments. This takes time and, and effectively the business, they, they want the savings, right? Um, but if you go and change, um, go lock yourself into reserved instances, then effectively you might block yourself from being able to downsize those instances. There's this real sort of balance between making sure you don't reserve too much. Um, and I guess the recommendation that, w that we always get to is the idea that if you look at what you could purchase with RIs and then you subtract away what's being recommended to be right sized, you're left with that area that is um, you know, fairly consistent and not going to block your right sizing uh, mechanisms. So purchase their, those RIs right away, but at the same time, make sure you engage your engineers into right sizing because the sooner they start changing their, their instance sizes, you're going to make those savings, and then that extra area will become available to you for, re for reserve. So, questions from the room? Got a couple of microphones there and there. Uh, all right. You can jump so, up there. Okay, recording. I want to make sure this works. Uh, one question I have for you, it sounded kind of like uh, on the Atlassian side that your RI purchasing team 
and the team that manages this is somewhat separate and isolated. So how do you deal with large project changes that are coming down the pipe? Do they report through you? And that way you're <coughs> considering that as part of the RI purchase process. Yeah, so we get the benefit, um, because we work alongside our engineers around their architecture design and deployments, we do see uh, a lot of visibility into the, what they're planning on. Um, and I guess it's having those insights from that part of our team, we can feed that into the RI purchasing. That was actually my question. Uh, it was around anticipating roadmap changes, things like that. So, what are you using to schedule uptime, for instances, so to turn them off at night and weekends? We do have a custom written script um, that's running around our accounts, uh, but basically it's tagged, um, a particular custom tag that we we have advised our engineers to use. Uh, and then when we're, the script runs around and finds that tag, and when it's outside of the, the uptime window, it does a, a shutdown and start. I'll do the plug because it's a newer feature that they haven't adopted yet, but we also now can automate those things with CloudAbility by tag or by auto-scaling group or by certain resources, so you can basically turn them up and down as well. Hi, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that wastage uh, metric that you make <coughs> visible to the individual teams. Can you yep. talk about that? Um, so basically, if you have a right size recommendation that has a, an amount of savings that you potentially make, um, by summing that up, um, we get a potential total savings per team because everything's tagged. We can then uh, look at the cost, um, the amount of spend that that team has on the platform. So um, you know, basically add up all of their EC2 costs if it's EC2 right sizing. Uh, and then the, the ratio of that is your wastage percentage. It's effectively you know, of your 100K spend, um, you know, 5K of it could be saved if you were to change your size, uh, and that becomes a 5% um, ratio. And then if a team is, uh, the example was, uh, you know, a 5K a month with a 1K save potential savings, that's more like a 10% wastage figure, uh, which means that, I guess, usually you'll find that, a, you know, a larger scale, there's going to be, a, a, you know, a few things here and there that, that um, are oversized, um, whereas a small scale, there's probably only one or two things that they have that are, that are oversized, but you can kind of get a much more clear picture of who's being more wasteful in the way they're deploying versus just an overall savings um, figure. Probably best if you grab the mic so everyone can hear. I'm wondering if you have any advice for best practices when you have over-provisioned RIs. We recently upgraded to PHP 7 and 40% of our fleet is obsolete. Um, and now we have like six months worth of RIs that... So I'm guessing the standard RI. Yeah. Um, Jay, I might have more to talk on that one, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that is the downside to the standards is that can happen. Uh, you know, typically we see people push out lists of unused RIs to teams to say, hey, it's kind of free money, it's already sunk cost. Uh, let's get that out there. I mean, in our tool, we'll give you a list of those that you can export that has, here's everything that's not utilized. Um, you can also try the marketplace. Uh, if you're not selling at big scale and you're, if you're not a public company, especially, it's easier to do the accounting. Uh, but we have seen people have good success there. Um, just, you know, basically try to get them out there, try to use them and, and make visibility better for them. Thank you. Question on? Yeah. Really, I'm just, really, my voice doesn't come back. Um, does it, um, does your waste go down to, if we're running, um, Docker on, on ECS, um, we talk about memory density for like the actual containers. I struggle sometimes with our app dev teams to say like, hey, we need a gig of RAM versus, well, you can probably get away with 750 megs or something like that, you know. D does it go down to that level too so we can say like, hey, if we made this change, this is how much money we could save type of thing. Uh, so the waste that we're talking about here is mainly going to be more at the you know instance level. I mean, sure, there's a whole other level so. <clears throat> introduced there with with containers. Um, so uh, we can also do the visibility within Kubernetes uh, as well. I'm very excited okay. for that announcement this morning. Um, and then there's sort of two parts to the container you know piece there. There's the visibility into sort of how much of that is being used and the cost associated. But then, as you're saying, there's also the aspect of um, what's the wasted portion of the resource reservation, and then how do we because you know, that would have that. a direct effect on what you're saying is actually being used on the instance itself, right? So if the container is going to say, I'm going to reserve a, a gig of memory for me, regardless if it's using it or not, it could, but it potentially would show up on your scan as being fully utilized when it's not. Yeah, container um, 
getting more visibility into into containers. It's something that we're working on actively at the moment at, okay. at Atlassian. I was just curious. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point though. It's definitely. a good challenge though, containerization. So I was curious about your, could you comment more about your elasticity metric and do you have target metrics for applications on that or how do you, how do you gauge what's good and bad? That is where we want to get to, target metrics on applications. Um, the, the idea, um, I guess, initially at this stage is to just show um, across the organization what teams are getting benefits of elasticity and then within the team what services are. Um, but yeah, target percentage would be, I guess, in our uh, architecture meetings that we want to try and get that in, into it. So where they're, they're designing to, towards elasticity and then they'll set what they expect that elasticity to look like. Um, and then, yeah, so it's definitely where we're heading towards. And, and big companies, we've seen people have really good success with having that sort of metric be benchmark against teams. So, you know, how elastic is this team? How much RI coverage does this one have? How right sized are they? To give a nice sort of scorecard of that. Uh, so you mentioned that um, you want the you want the resize to not uh, able to affect the performance, right? So I was wondering, uh, how do you determine the correct resize target? Or like, yeah. You just had. Good story on this, didn't you? Um, so basically, it's I guess it's looking across all the metrics, um, so memory, CPU, network, and then ensuring that you're using max figures through the period, so that you you know what the peaks are through the period you're looking at, yeah. um, and then by visualizing what that maximums are across each of the metrics, and then showing how much that that um, the overhead would drop if you change down on instance sizes. Um, yeah, and, and I guess with our engineers, they, they want to, we give them the last mile because there may be perfect reasons why it's oversized. Um, you know, it might be a, a lead node on a cluster that does nothing until something fails, or it might be a hot DR node, et cetera. Um, but, and they also then usually have way more metrics in things like Datadog or New Relic or whatever that they can lean uh, into in their investigation. So it's more really just focus them down on where we can see a potential saving, and that's why we keep calling it potential. Um, because it, there may be reasons why you can't resize it, but then giving it out to the engineers who are in the know, they have all the extra metrics that they can see and business, business logic behind it. And this is why we talk a lot about the multiple recommendations, because there's a business trade-off decision. Like, it, you may have times when you want to go for the most savings, and there may be times when you're willing to pay more uh, for lower latency, and we were talking about a case of that that you know, saw recently where uh, a switch was made in the infrastructure and it ended up being much more expensive, but the latency was down. So, you know, look to the one that matters for what's happening for the application. So, um, do you guys actually spend some time, like in Sandbox or whatever, to test the correct target? Or yeah, so I guess we do have dev stage prod um, pipelines, with okay. load tests, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And the, yeah, it's up to the engineering teams to figure out the risk profile. So, some internal services probably just get changed and then they see how it goes and more public facing, customer facing stuff would go through a whole review process. Okay, okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, do you guys have a uh, metric for how many people you have on your cloud spend per of your total bill? Is there a rule of thumb for how big you guys think it should be? When you say people, you're saying like customers they have or? Well, no, just or... people working on it, like the size of your cloud economics team. Uh, my, my team? Yeah. Uh, we're six engineers. Um, so that's working through security, through architecture, and cost alt. As far as the tag and stuff, um, what do you guys, what does Cloudability do about un the untaggable resources and the um, stuff you might buy from Marketplace? I mean, yeah. I know that you can go through some sort of model where you're saying you guys use 30%, you guys use 40%, but what do you guys do? Yeah, uh, I, I would I would have us push back on this question a little bit to say uh, there's actually not a lot that's untaggable anymore. Uh, basically, anything that's variable consumption you can tag. Um, so we've got a thing called the the tag explorer that basically will map out two things. It'll show all of your taggable resources and what is untagged, and then we'll also show your untaggable resources and what they are. Uh, so you know, typically we find that a, a lot of the work really needs to be first into tagging things that can be tagged that are not yet tagged because you know data transfer can get inherited if the you know, resource itself is tagged, things like that. Um, you know, and then it becomes a question of how you want to allocate that un, you know, untaggable, uh, unallocatable pieces. So we see people do it different ways. Sometimes it's a peanut butter. Uh, sometimes they have a, a central team that eats certain costs. Uh, just really depends on how they want to break that out. The question of marketplaces related to allocation, or you're saying how do we then report marketplace purchasing? 
I was just figuring, if, seeing if you guys had a Swiss Army knife that you could put in and say, hey, I know that this portion of my organization uses 40% of uh, this certain resource. And so across, for that resource, you'd say, okay, I'm going to give them 40% and then these people 30, 20, 10. Right, exactly. So typically, sometimes people have those fixed allocations, right, where they'll say, this is split between these companies in this ways. Um, ideally, you're doing it based on some consumption basis, right? There's some metric you're tracking of you know, API calls or, or something in that area, uh, but it really depends on how you want to split it out. I just made sure I'm not doing it through spreadsheets again. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> to kind of to kind of build on that question, um, network cost. That's something that is not taggable, and um, you know you said the peanut butter spread. That's something we're looking at. But is there another way of doing that? Because uh, you know we want people to pay for what they consume, and it's hard yeah. to do that with network to say that you consume this much of the bandwidth or whatever, right? So if we there, get to that level of detail, I don't know if others are doing that today. There's an earlier conversation in the cost allocation bit that we actually pulled out of this, which is uh, your tag versus linked account strategy also. Yeah. Uh, and to say, you know, a lot of people lean into tags heavily, but if you really want to allocate all the costs for something, having linked accounts that contain a cost center or an application are a really great way to say that you know, everything that's running in here we know belongs to this thing. So uh, the people who have the, the cleanest allocation I've seen have uh, an account for each thing they need to allocate from a financial perspective, and then they have tags beneath that that get more into the operational pieces. So if you can, if you can dial back strategy depending on where you are to get to that level, then you never really end up in a spot where we don't know who this thing belongs to because it's in that account, it's theirs, even if it's not tagged. Yeah, yeah. good suggestion. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, if you get a chance to swing by our booth, there's copies of the book. Uh, I've just got, I've just got one yeah. question. Yeah. Um, how do you interact with your finance teams? Um, so we have a weekly meetup uh, with our lead fp &A, um, and then um, we are slowly pushing more and more of our reports to the rest of her, her department. Um, and then, um, yeah, so it's really that, that weekly catch up. We, she helps us fine tune the reports that we're generating, and then she's helping us then push it out to the, the budget leads and the, the, the engineering leads. Okay, thanks. Have a great day. Cheers. Thanks, guys.